puppies. So people want puppies, and people want to foster puppies, and, so, and we're euthanizing puppies. So save them, put them in foster homes, let people have them. Um, and we, we didn't know that we'd be able to conquer that category very quickly, um, but it turned out that we started in June of 2008, and by November, we just because we saved our first Parvo puppies, we were like, okay, well, we have a Parvo home now, which was mine, and uh, <laughs> why don't we just commit to saving them all? And, in, and so we quietly did that. I don't think you need to quietly do it. I think it would actually be better if you loudly make a commitment to saving all the puppies because then you can get a lot more support, funding, volunteers, and fosters. But um, uh, we were able to actually pull it off the minute we decided to do it because there were not that many puppies compared to the rest of the group that were being euthanized. And this is the most desirable group that is being euthanized. Um, they're dying because there's not enough space. Um, if they... Uh, it, if they, if they had their three days, um, a lot of shelters, when they're still at a very high euthanasia rate, um, they, the turnover happens after their three-day stray hold. And it doesn't matter if you're the most adorable little puppy that's ever lived. If your three days is up, it's up. And, um, and so some of these were very healthy and had zero problems, super cute, just were in a litter of 10 others that were also super cute. Half of them get adopted, half don't. What do you do with them? Um, they also were dying, obviously, because of problems, because they're very susceptible to disease, and they're fragile. So parvo, mange, ringworm, diarrhea, broken bones, being too little. And also um, a big fear is that they'll contract disease while they're at the shelter. And so one of the motivations for euthanizing is to prevent a, an illness outbreak. Um, and so not keeping a lot of puppies around for a long time is a motivator um, uh, you know, and, and it makes sense because puppies are very fragile. Uh, so the strategies are as many foster homes as possible. Get them out of the shelter. Push them out. And again, people want them. We didn't get 100% um, saved in the first summer, but we did in the second summer. And disease treatment plans. And again, you know, looking at the euthanasia list, we're not, we didn't have to put 100% of the puppies that came into the shelter into our foster program. Only the ones that didn't, weren't going to make it out alive. So that's a small fraction of the ones that came into the shelter because, again, they're the most desirable, so they're getting out through other means. Um, creating disease treatment plans for whatever, whatever is their problem, creating it and sending them to foster with it, sending them to their adopters with it. We had some speakers yesterday talking about that, and I think that that's really important because there's no reason that we have to hold on to these animals and let it, because they need to heal in our care. There's people out there that are perfectly capable of doing it themselves. So let, empower your fosters, empower your adopters, let them do it. That, that creates a bond. Why bond with a foster why have a puppy that has a broken leg bond with a foster through the healing process when it's its most marketable with that broken leg, right when the broken leg happens? Get them into an adoption home, let the adopter be the foster, and they bond with the animal instead. And then your foster, who wouldn't, of course all the fosters want to, um, to foster the ones that have broken legs too, but you can redirect them to one that maybe there's not a line of people wanting to adopt and waiting. Parvo Ward, um, we'll talk about later, and then, yeah, just foster. The contagious disease, these are the challenges everybody knows. Hard to find foster for contagious diseases. Um, hard to keep in the shelter if they contract a contagious disease. And then keeping them healthy from contagious disease is difficult. And then one challenge that we faced early on that's no longer a challenge for us for some reason was that they were people, fosters would hold on to them and not turn their cage space over, and so they, the animal would grow up and foster, and then by the time it got to an adoption event, it was six months old and not as cute as it used to be. And this last slide, these, I put these little puppies up there because this stage of puppy, even though they've got massive demodex, and um, we call them chupacabras in Austin, they are still more adoptable than a four-month fully-haired pit bull mix. So get them out when they're little. And even if they have a problem, send them home with medicine. You can be their vet for that one specific problem. It's not that hard. We have not had a, a, a high um, irritation level with adopters that adopt these animals. They come in for their promeris, they pick it up after 30 days, and then we send them home with information on how to get it so they can keep doing it at home. Um, puppy challenges, uh, puppy stats. So in November of 08, we decided to rescue all of the puppies. And we were successful. Now, once we pull them out, they don't all survive because they've got prop some of them have problems. Um, Parvo, we have an 85% survival rate. 
Um, we have uh, mange is 100% as long as there's not another problem. Ringworm, 100%. Fractures, 100%. We haven't had any puppies die of fractures, which I think is really interesting because there's so many that come in hit by cars. We take everything that's still alive. Um, if the shelter says, we just got this dog hit by a car, we take it. And we have had a 100% success rate with the puppies, um, which is, again, a kind of uh, uh, amazing. And I think that speaks more to their ability to heal than us being amazing. Um, and uh, distemper is a big question mark, which we'll talk about later. So 4,700 puppies since 2008.